Hi, today we're going to talk about front-end workflows with AngularJS and Grunt. This is a continuation of the screencast series that I've been working through uh, building a sample app with AngularJS uh, and in the second version of that screencast and to end with AngularJS we worked with Laravel as a backend. Uh, there was another screencast called Security with AngularJS uh, and so this is basically a continuation of that and I'd like to think that this screencast can stand on its own as sort of um, an introduction to Grunt and the idea of workflow tools. Uh, but there will be some pieces that we're going to examine near the end that have context uh, that you'll be missing if you haven't watched the previous screencasts. Uh, so you can either check out the code on GitHub to get that context, or go and check out those screencasts and then come back here. So what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to look at three key areas. We're going to look at understanding the core tools, uh, just how you can build a basic workflow with GruntJS. Uh, then once we've done that, we've kind of got a really good foundation for the basics of Grunt. Uh, we're going to look at examining a, an abstraction. Uh, there's a tool uh, that uh, my coworker Justin Searles from Testable, which is where I work, uh, and myself uh, have created called LineMan.js, and it's basically uh, a higher level tool that utilizes Grunt under the hood, um, but also adds some nice abstractions uh, for our workflow. So we're going to show you that. And then we'll take a look at a specific a specific example of porting um, our end-to-end, -end, uh, or the app that we built in end-to-end -end, uh, with AngularJS to this workflow, uh, and that brings forth some interesting discussion points. So as we go along, you know, I've got this extras at the bottom, we'll talk about um, a couple of different ideas. The, the idea of treating a web app as a first-class citizen, um, how, we, how can we decouple our client-side code from the server side, uh, and sort of some of the advantages that that brings. Um, this idea of productivity and how we can use uh, task automation uh, as a way to boost productivity for not only ourselves but for people on our team. And then uh, examining the browser as a deployment target. Um, this is an interesting idea that I think uh, has sort of really become more viable as the power in the browser grows and as the availability of tools like Grunt uh, has sort of become commonplace. So that's what we're going to work through. Let's start at the beginning with understanding the core tools with basic Grunt.js. Uh, if you haven't heard of Grunt, it's um, the, ta the tagline uh, that was recently decided on uh, basically sums it up really accurately. It's a, it's a task runner for JavaScript. And it's basically analogous to something like Ant on the server side, or maybe you have a project that you've configured using MakeScripts uh, to automate some of those sort of mundane things that developers do all the time. You know copying files to certain directories, deleting things. Uh, on the front end, we have optimizations that we do for concatenating files together uh, so that we can work in multiple separate files in dev. And then when we go to prod, we have one sort of concatenated minified file. Um, that's, in essence, kind of what Grunt enables you to do. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, it's got a bunch of default plugins built in, but it also uh, allows you to create custom tasks on your own so that you can kind of create your own workflow. Uh, and, and so I like the way that the, the web page frames it here. Why would you use a task runner? And I think right off the hop, um, whoever wrote this it was probably Ben Allman, uh, who created Grunt, uh, has it nailed really well. You know, in ordered automation, the less work you have to do in performing repetitive tasks, uh, the easier your job be becomes. And in addition to that, I think that developers uh, who don't have these kinds of workflow tools often spend a lot of time um, chewing up their mind share uh, with cognitive load thinking about these things and working on these small uh, sort of mundane tasks. And when we can automate this, we free up our mind uh, from thinking about all of these uh, things. We free up that cognitive load to enable us to do things like write better applications and things like that. So that's Grunt in a nutshell. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually make uh, a little workflow with Grunt. So I'm just going to make a directory called with Grunt. Let's go in there. And uh, we're going to be working with Node and NPM. I'm assuming you're familiar with those things because uh, they are pieces of the puzzle that you need when you're working with setting up a, a workflow with Grunt. Now, we're just going to set up a vanilla workflow with a very basic set of targets uh, and tasks to give you an idea of how you can do this on your own. The first thing you'll need to do is you'll, you'll need Node installed. Uh, I have 10.3 at the time of recording of this screencast. Uh, you'll need NPM installed as well, 1.2.17. I'm a little bit behind, but it should work fine if you're even a few revisions behind or if you've installed uh, and updated to the latest version of Node. 
So the first thing that we'll need to do is we'll need to install uh, the Grunt CLI globally. I've already got it installed, so I'm not going to run through this, but this is how you would do it. npm install Grunt CLI G. And what that does is that gives you the uh, ability to run this Grunt command from your terminal. So you can see there when I run Grunt, I see the Grunt CLI, uh, and I get an error right away, unable to find local Grunt. So Grunt CLI is basically just the shell command uh, that sort of kicks off um, running tasks in a workflow with Grunt. But we need uh, a couple more pieces to the puzzle in order to be able to do that. And the first one is we need to um, have a package JSON file. And the easiest way to get a package JSON file uh, is to do npm init. Uh, so we're going to call it with Grunt. We'll just kind of hit enter through these things. Uh, a workflow with Grunt. That's fine. We don't have a test. We don't have a git repo. None of this. I'm going to put my name in as the author and the license, and that's fine. You can see that it gives you uh, a little preview of what it's going to write. We'll say yes. And uh, we don't have a readme file. That's okay. And so now, if we go back to Sublime Text, uh, let's open this up. There we go. We can see we got that package JSON file uh, with our name and everything. Uh, the, the reason that this is important isn't for all this metadata, but um, for the way that Grunt works with dependencies, it uses NPM to install uh, its task dependencies and things like that. And so after we've got our package JSON, the next thing that we're going to want to do is install Grunt, uh, the actual sort of core of the framework, locally as a dependency in, into our workflow. Uh, so let's do that here. I'm going to cancel that and just add dash save. Uh, when you add that flag, it'll actually modify our package JSON. And it should go out to uh, NPM on the World Wide Web and grab things. If it's not super slow, there we go. It's pulling in all the dependencies. Um, when you add a package, you can see when it's finished, it added it to node modules slash grunt. And then it's got a list of all of the top level dependencies that grunt depends on. Uh, so now if we go grunt, um, we get a different error message that says a valid grunt file couldn't be found. And a grunt file is the place that we are going to configure our workflow uh, with Grunt. So let's add that, gruntfile.js with a capital G. And if we go back to Sublime Text, uh, there's nothing in it, uh, but we're going to basically create this from scratch. And so the way that we do this is we add a function that we're going to add to module.exports. Um, and this is going to be uh, executed when the Grunt CLI runs from the command line. It's going to grab this. Um, function from gruntfile.js. It's going to inject the grunt runtime into here, uh, and then we're able to do some things. And the first way that we are wanting to interact with grunt to set up our workflow uh, is using this idea of initializing a config. And the config in grunt is basically uh, the set of task configuration targets that we're going to add for our workflow. Uh, the first one that you'll run into probably wanting to need is uh, so that grunt can get a handle to uh, the local package JSON so that we can, uh, sometimes there's useful metadata that we can use from that uh, to pull in. So let's do that. And now, if we run Grunt, we shouldn't have an error anymore, but there's no, no default task. So one nice thing about Grunt is as you're working with it, uh, the authors ha have put a, a lot of effort into uh, making uh, things kind of user friendly as you um, add uh, configuration targets and things like that. If you don't have things quite the right way, you'll get some pretty useful error messages in the console. So let's think uh, and just talk for a little bit about what we want to do with this workflow. Uh, perhaps we've got a, a member of our team who's maybe not so much a, a developer, uh, maybe they're just a designer and they want a workflow uh, using Grunt um, and they don't really know what they need, but they know that they want to be able to uh, you know, not worry about having to concatenate files or add a new script element, uh, you know, to a web page when they're working on some prototypes or things like that. So we're going to set up a workflow that um, automates some of those steps uh, just, you know, to alleviate their cognitive load, this, this designer person on our team, uh, so that they can uh, be more efficient at what they're doing and produce prototypes faster. And so when we think about, uh, you know, the way that that person would interact with this, um, the first thing that we might want to do is give them a place to store their files. So let's just add a couple folders. Um, we're going to add a source folder, and we're going to add a vendor folder. And these could be whatever you want. I'm just you know crafting this workflow for this person, and I'm going to tell them uh, whenever you stick um, files inside of source, you know if they're JavaScript, they should go there. If they're CSS, they should go there. And whenever you stick uh, files inside of vendor, 
uh, vendor being sort of third-party libraries that you're going to add, whether you're using Twitter Bootstrap or any JavaScript files or CSS files, uh, we're going to stick them in those directories. And the workflow that we're going to set up uh, is such that um, when they are interacting with the terminal or running Grunt, um, we're going to set up some rules that will basically concatenate all those files together and emit them out into uh, an HTML page so that uh, their workflow you know, changes from having to add script and uh, link um, CSS elements into their HTML uh, so that they can just basically add um, files to those directories and Grunt will sort of automate the process of compiling those things and sticking them together. And the first task that we're going to configure uh, is this idea of concatenation. And uh, there's a couple of things that you uh, do when you're setting up um, grunt tasks. There's a number of built-ins that you can check out. So we'll just take a look here at the plugins. Uh, and you can see that uh, here's a bunch of the um, popular plugins, uh, contrib, contrib clean. There's a whole bunch of different things. And here's the one that we're going to use, contrib concat. And so the first thing we'll do is we're going to configure it with this target in the config uh, for the task. And we want to concatenate both JavaScript and CSS. So let's do that. And uh, there's a couple of things that we want to tell Grunt. Um, we want to configure it so that uh, it's going to load any of the files in uh, vendor.js first and then uh, any of the files in source.js. Similarly for CSS, it's going to look pretty much the same, except that instead of JS, we're just going to change these to uh, CSS. So let's grab those. There we go. And so now we've configured the task with this, um, this block so that when our uh, designer person drops any of those files into here, um, we're going to uh, look for these things and stick them together in, in uh, that order. We also need to tell this task where we want that stuff to be output. And so when our designer person is working, uh, we're going to create them uh, basically a, a directory where all this stuff is going to go. We're going to call it dev. And so that is going to be the destination, which is this desk target, where we stick that stuff. And uh, we want to call the destination is basically the path and the name of the file. Um, uh, and this one should be JS. So just to recap, we've got our concat configuration block. Um, we've got a target of JavaScript and a target of CSS, and each of those have a specific list of files. Um, the star star glob uh, is basically going to make it so that even if we had subdirectories under these two, uh, that we would be able to grab things um, pretty easily. Uh, without having to worry about specifying those directories. It's just going to spider recursively into the directory and find find the files and put them together in the right order. Uh, the order that these things will get put together in is basically uh, dependent on the way that this globbing mechanism works for your operating system. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, this differs slightly on OS X uh, on a Mac versus Windows versus Linux just uh, because of the way the file system is set up. So here's our concat uh, target, but we also need to um, add uh, those tasks. Uh, so we've configured them, we also need to add them. And the way that we do that is uh, using something called load npm tasks. Uh, grunt contrib concat is the name of that task that we looked at there. Yep, uh, It's available from npm. So we, we're going to tell Grunt, hey, you need to load this thing. Uh, and then we also need to install it. So let's do that. npm install grunt contrib concat. Save it going to go out and grab it, and you can see that if we look back in our package JSON file, uh, it added grunt for us, it added grunt contrib and cat with you know, the right versions, it's approximately going to install this, uh, this version and any minor revisions automatically for us with that little tilde. Uh, and then now we should be able to run grunt, and we're going to still get uh, the idea that this task default is not found. Um, so here's the pattern that we've gone through. Um, we've configured a task. And we've loaded a task from NP an NPM module. And the last thing that we need to do is we need to set up our workflow. Uh, and we do that with grunt.register task. So for right now, let's just uh, stick default in there because it's asking for that default task. It needs to know which one to run. And let's just stick concat in there, which is the name of the task that we want to run.
So again, configured the task, loaded that specific task from an NPM module. Uh, we'll look a little bit later at loading a, a custom task. And then we've set up our workflow. So now when I run, you can see that uh, I get a message for each of those targets, concat CSS uh, and concat JS. Uh, and it created my output for me, so I can take a look in dev. And obviously there's nothing in here yet because uh, we haven't stuck anything in these directories. And so now, you know, we have a, a basic way that our designer person could, uh, you know, maybe we set them up with this. We maybe create a wrapper around this terminal session with a GUI or something. Maybe we just teach them how to use the terminal because that's a useful skill. And they can run Grunt uh, and they can get that concatenation. Um, not super useful uh, because they don't have any way to view that inside of a web page yet. So let's add a custom task. So we looked at loading a task from NPM. Uh, let's load a custom task. And so in order to do that, we're just going to create a folder in here called tasks. And we'll tell Grant to load tasks, any tasks that it finds inside of that tasks directory. The task that we're going to add is going to be one to um, generate this home page. Uh, that we want our designers to be able to work with. So let's do that. Uh, we're going to start with the config block for that first, uh, so we can get an idea of exactly what we're going to work with. And so our designer, you know, they're going to work with this thing, um, and we want to add um, a specific template file that they can add markup to. Uh, so we're going to call this uh, index.us for underscore. We're going to make it an underscore template. And you could use whatever templating language you want. There's lots that work with. Uh, node and grunt, we're just going to use this for now. Um, and this will basically, let's just pull in our uh, code from end-to-end -end, uh, with AngularJS. So we're going to grab uh, that markup that we had, our ng app directive at the top, and all of, all of the stuff that we're going to stick into here. And you'll notice that there's a couple of um, things that are going to stick out at you. Uh, this link element at the top, this is our style sheet element. It's going to go in, in right before the closing head tag. We're going to inject any of the CSS uh, that comes from our um, concatenated output here from dev in, into this template when we compile it and make an HTML file. And any of the JavaScript here from uh, these vendor JavaScript and source JavaScript directories, it's going to go into one bundle here. Uh, and we're going to do this so that as our designer is prototyping this app or this, you know, this website, they can just dump files into these directories. Uh, maybe they can use a, a client-side a package manager like Bower uh, or Ender, and they can dump things in here. Uh, we're not going to set that up for them right now, but we're just going to basically set up the uh, the uh, code so that they can do that. Uh, and the scenario here is that they're working on this Angular app that we built in the previous screencasts. So let's flesh out this homepage task a little bit more and show you how to build a custom task. So we want a different target for um, dev uh, so that we can stick the output in there. And we're going to say that the destination is going to be uh, dev slash index.html, and we need to pass a context into this template, uh, and we need to tell it this is where you can find uh, the JavaScript file, and this is where you can find the CSS file. Oops, app.css, there we go. So that's all the configuration we need, and we are basically creating this from scratch. Um, there is, uh, there's a couple of tasks that you can get that will do this, but I figured it would be a really good exercise to, to showcase how we can make a custom task. So let's add our home page task. It's just a JavaScript file. And let's start making this again, similar to how we interacted with the grunt file using module exports. Uh, we're going to do the same thing here. Tasks are simple functions that are exported. They inject the grunt runtime again. We're going to use underscore, uh, which is a pretty useful library because Grunt actually includes a copy of it. And I believe they're using something called Lodash, uh, which is basically a, an underscore JS compatible API. And uh, again, kind of like we uh, registered our default task here at, and gave Grunt the list of tasks that it should execute, uh, we're going to um, register another task with the name uh, homepage. And the description uh, generates a homepage HTML file for our app. Uh, it's going to take a function with a target, which is the configuration uh, target from uh, our config file right here. And yeah, we're going to do a bunch of stuff here. We need to get a context for our template that we added. Uh, we need to get the source file. Uh, we need to get our configuration for that target. And then we need a template that we can write out to a file. So one of the things that you might run into is uh, when you're creating these tasks, you're going to want to be able to pull information from 
the config that the users are adding, and you might want to also have some sens sensible defaults. So we're going to grab the uh, the target, um, and we're going to say that it's uh, right now it's dev, but um, if they haven't provided it, we're going to call it dist for distribution. And another cool thing about Grunt is you can actually uh, add some hints for your users. Um, so if we say that requires config, if they don't actually have this config block, um, it'll actually uh, throw an error to them. So we're going to grab, say that uh, this task requires the homepage template config as well as uh, the target, whatever they pass in. So in this case, uh, dev or dist if they didn't have it. Um, let's grab our template. Uh, once we've ensured that they've got that, let's grab the target configuration. Uh, similarly, let's grab the source file. Uh, we want to read that template file in, which is our index.us. So we're going to read that in, and then we're going to grab the context for our template. Uh, we're going to grab the original configuration from Grunt, uh, which is basically the entirety of this config um, for the homepage task. And then we're going to extend it using underscores extend uh, with uh, the context from our target config. So that is uh, this one here. And then we're going to write out a file uh, using grunt.file.write. Uh, we're going to grab the target config dot um, destination. And then we want the value that we want to write. And the value that we want to write is using underscores template function, passing that context, which is basically going to grab this template, inject our CSS um, bundle and our JavaScript bundle into this file. And then the last thing that we want to do is just kind of provide some quality of life uh, for the user to let them know that this actually succeeded. Uh, so we can say homepage HTML written. Uh, let's target config.dest, and that will actually log things out. So if we did everything well, uh, this seems like a lot to take in, but once we run grunt, then you'll be able to see how this kind of interacts. So let's run grunt again. Oh, right, we didn't actually add the task. Uh, so we, can, we did our step where we configured the task. Um, we've loaded the custom task so it's available, but we also need to make it available inside of the context of uh, the register task at the bottom. So let's do that. You can actually provide single tasks to default, or you can provide an array of tasks. And this is sort of how we start crafting our workflow. Um, so let's grab homepage, uh, and let's say dev. We're going to actually specify the specific target right there uh, that uh, we want the, the homepage task to run. And now, if we run this, uh, you can see there we got homepage dev, so the concatenation happened if we had some files in there, and we got homepage dev written out to dev index HTML. Let's just open dev index.html and take a look. Uh, we got an undefined error because I haven't actually included any script files in there. Uh, we take a look. Um, we can see that all of our markup is there just fine, um, but none of those files are. We've got a single app.js, which is empty. So let's just add a couple files in there so that you can kind of see how this works. Um, so let's say we added uh, uh, foundation.css, and uh, it makes the background of the body blue. And let's say we added uh, blurter.js, and it's a vendor library, and it just says, uh, alerts, I'm a vendor library. And in our app code, let's add uh, app.js and another one uh, to say um, styles.css. And it makes any H1 elements uh, have a background color of red. And in app.js, we'll make him console.log and the App.js. Uh, this is a pretty trivial example, just so we can see that uh, our concatenation task is actually working. So let's run it again. Oops. Uh, front. There we go. Let's reload this guy. So there, you can see that uh, our styles got applied. I'm a vendor library was loaded, and console.log, I'm the app.js. So now you can see that the order of inclusion for these things uh, is basically the same as the order that we defined it in the concat task. So we've got 
Um, anything in vendor comes first, then anything in source comes next. So you can see that the vendor library came first, and then anything in the source came second. Let's take a look at the CSS. You can see that anything in the vendor stuff came first, uh, which was our foundation, with the body background blue, and then our custom app styles with uh, H1 being the background color red. So this isn't uh, incredibly useful, but basically what we've set our designer up with is uh, an, a workflow where they can drop um, files into folders and have a home page that's generated here in index.html, uh, and they can you, you know kind of work with that. Um, but this isn't super helpful because we haven't actually automated anything, right? We're still requiring our designer to come in here and execute the grunt task uh, to run that single pass of those things every time something happens. So let's let's add a little bit more automation to this. Um, there's something called grunt contrib watch, and what watch does is uh, it lets you define targets for um, monitoring files on the file system to see when they change. Uh, and then you can actually use that change event to trigger running a task. And this is how we can kind of automate our tasks. So let's work with um, watch. Let's set up targets for JavaScript, CSS, and our homepage file, so that if the designer changes the homepage file, then uh, it'll automatically run these things. And watch takes targets, and then it, it listens for files, and then it runs tasks. So this is the, um, the configuration that we can work with. And this uh, showcases another one of the cool features about Grunt is that you can actually reference um, internal pieces of other uh, configuration targets. So we've already defined the order that we want our files to be loaded in here uh, for Concat. Um, so we can actually reuse that when we're saying, Grunt, these are the files that I want you to watch. So we can uh, grab that named target um, and use that as a list of files that uh, we want to watch. And then the task that we want to execute in this case um, is concat.js, which is going to send uh, Grunt a message to run the concat target uh, and the JS target inside of there. So similarly for CSS, uh, we can grab that reference from uh, concat.css, uh, and then we want to run concat.css as the task. And as well for the home page, we want to grab homepage.template, so the homepage target that template file, whenever it changes, we want to recompile and we want to run home page dev. So again, we've configured that watch task. Uh, we need to load it. It's an npm task, so let's do that. We need to install it. Uh, watch. And it's going to pull that in. Let's check our package JSON. Yep, there we go. We got the latest version. So we've configured it, we've loaded it, and now we need to set it up in our workflow. And so the last thing we'll do is add watch to this list. And now what our user gets when they type grunt, uh, the concatenation happened, the generation of the homepage happened, and there's a watcher happening so that when I go here and, for example, change the background color of that H1 from red to orange, I can hit Command S to save. You can see that that watcher noticed that that file on disk changed. Uh, it reran the appropriate task. Uh, it gave me a timestamp, and then it's continuing to watch and wait. And so now our user can just leave that running in the background, um, and they can see this. There's another really cool plugin that I'm not going to dive into today called Live Reload that works really well for uh, static websites. Um, not necessarily appropriate for um, complex web applications where you've got long-lived state in the browser. Live Reload will, you know, detect these changes and then it has a hook um, through a, a Chrome plugin that'll actually reload this so that uh, our designer doesn't have to come back to the page and actually hit Command R to get those changes loaded in the browser. So again, works really well for static websites, not so great for, you know, rich client applications where you've got long-lived state in the browser. So this is about all that I wanted to cover uh, in terms of the basics of Grunt, you know, talking about configuring a task with these targets, um, loading them from npm if that's where they come from, loading custom tasks, uh, and you can doesn't this directory doesn't have to be called tasks, you can call it whatever you want. Uh, we basically set up a, a place for our designer to store static files and a workflow so that they can just jam files into these directories uh, and not have to worry about adding script elements and CSS elements to our page. Uh, we looked at loading a custom task for our home page. Uh, and there's a, there's a little bit of density in here. I hope that uh, I explained that well enough, but uh, you can always check out the source code after. This home page task is actually part of a collection of tasks 
that uh, I'll be covering in a little bit that we use on a regular basis when we're building rich client applications um, using Lineman, which we're going to talk about next. The main point that I wanted to get across is this idea of automating things. Uh, it's really easy. You just think about um, what are the, the pieces that I need to automate in my workflow, whether I'm automating them for myself or somebody else, and start putting them together. You know, you work with this grunt file, you configure things, um, you can load external tasks, create your own, and then you just create a workflow, right? This is a really simple workflow, concat, homepage dev, and watch. Uh, and yet, this simple workflow really eliminates a number of manual steps. It's going to alleviate cognitive load for whoever's going to use this, and that's basically all I wanted to get across when we're talking about grunt. So uh, you can see that this folder is called with grunt, and the source code that's going to be available on GitHub will have a folder called that with a few more configuration targets that I didn't have time to get into today, uh, but they should be fairly straightforward to understand. So let's move on to the next thing that we were going to talk about, and that is looking at abstractions and higher level tools. Lineman is a workflow tool um, that I mentioned Justin Searles, my coworker, and I have written. Uh, he actually wrote the majority of the first implementation uh, for a project that we were working on, you know, maybe eight or nine months ago. And um, it turned out to be really useful, and we've kind of just continually added to it since. Uh, so let's just take a look at some of the features of Lineman. Uh, let's go here. Uh, so here's our with grunt directory that we just created. Uh, we set up that workflow uh, there. Now we're going to do one with Lineman. And we're just going to briefly take a, a look at some of the features of Lineman. Not all of them, but just enough to give you an idea of how this workflow tool would work in concert with um, grunt and would allow you to write rich web applications. Lineman is targeted specifically at rich web applications, um, whether they're mobile, but basically things that are going to be in the browser um, and typically things that are single page apps. So you can set it up to work with multiple page apps, but um, it was intended to be used uh, with single page apps. To get Lineman, similar to installing Grunt, you can do npm install lineman-g, that will pull you in the latest version, and that gives you a command line tool. Uh, so let's grab... So I'm running Lineman 0.7.1. Um, let's take a look at some of the commands that you can get. Uh, so we've got a new command which uh, generates a new Lineman project. It's basically our only generator. Um, you just give it a folder name and it will scaffold you out uh, a directory structure. Uh, run for running a development server. Build for when you're ready to build uh, your assets down to production. It's got a test runner as well. It runs uh, and configures something automatically called Testum, which is a really, uh, really useful uh, runner. We've got a clean target so that we can clean out um, our dev and our production folders. Um, and then if you want to run any arbitrary task, you can use um, lineman grunt to do that as well. So that's sort of the command line that you get. Let's take a look at uh, how the scaffolding works. Uh, so let's go to code. Uh, let's do lineman new with lineman. And you can see that it finished pretty fast. And the reason for this is uh, you don't install Lineman into your local uh, directory. You just install it globally, and it sits there. Um, it's got an internal archetype that it uses to generate a directory structure. And then we can go into there. As you can see, it gives you some instructions and this fancy ASCII art. Um, but all that did was basically scaffold us out enough so that we could actually uh, start things up. Let's take a look at what this looks like, what this directory structure looks like. So when we were setting up our vanilla grunt workflow, we had um, a couple directories. We had that vendor directory. You know, this is very similar. The only dependency that you get out of the box is underscore JS with Lineman in the vendor directory. Uh, here's our tasks directory, so that if you wanted to add custom grunt tasks, you can do that here. Uh, the testing setup goes in here. I'm not going to dig too much into that. I've got ideas for another screencast to talk about testing later. Um, and then the, the other two directories are sort of important. App is basically uh, all of the source code for your app. So CSS, images, and JavaScript and then any template files. And you can use underscore templates, handlebars templates, uh, out of the box as sort of the default template implementations. The other folder that I want to just highlight on this sort of uh, tour of the, the scaffold that you get is this config folder. So previously with Grunt, we had everything sort of stuck in this Grunt file, uh, all of the targets, and everything was in here. Uh, what we found is that with Lineman, it made sense to split some of those concerns into separate files. 
Um, so all of this stuff interacts with uh, the grunt configuration, but we split it over a couple of files, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the first is that lineman actually includes a set of default tasks that you can extend from. So let's just take a look at uh, lineman's default tasks. This is a CoffeeScript file. You can use CoffeeScript or JavaScript. Um, lineman's configured to, to work with both. So we've set uh, a bunch of tasks that are common to our workflow here um, that we basically have as a baseline for all of the rich web applications we've worked on in the last 18 months. These are sort of the minimum set of tasks in our workflow that we need. So the ability to compile CoffeeScript, um, LESS, which is a style sheet preprocessor framework, um, JS hint for JavaScript files, super useful for making sure you don't leave a trailing comma in IE uh, handlebars, um, the ability to just co compile arbitrary templates into this JST namespace, uh, concat, which I've already showed you, uh, a little um, task to copy images from dev to production. It doesn't do any uh, image uh, optimization or anything like that. It's basically just a copy or same with web fonts. And then there's our homepage tasks. So these should be pretty familiar. Uh, then we've got um, some dev lifecycle tasks that we've classified. So the ability to run a dev server and then that watch, which you run in dev. And then a whole bunch of things related to production. Uh, when you're ready to build, you can run lineman build. Uh, and it basically will run this set of grunt tasks. Uglify to minify things on the JavaScript side. Um, CSS min to minify CSS, copying images to their respective folders, uh, same with web fonts, and then running the homepage task in its uh, distribution. So this is all I want to show you about sort of the, the built-in uh, set of default tasks. Basically, when you run lineman new and you scaffold out uh, a directory, you're going to get this set of default tasks. But you can totally change uh, and interact with that, and that's what we're going to take a look at here. So this application um, JS file is where you would add any any additional task configurations that you would want to use. And there's a couple of commented out notes here. We're going to dive into that a little bit later. And similarly with files, uh, anything that you would want to override here um, would control load order. So kind of like we had in our vanilla grunt uh, with the, the concat task loading things, um, we've got some sensible defaults that you can extend from here. Uh, so that's basically the, the tour of what Lineman gives you in terms of scaffold. So very lightweight. Uh, some default uh, tasks, uh, and some default targets that you can work to extend. So let's take a look at how I extended that stuff uh, when I was building the, um, the next part, which is the with lineman. So I scaffolded it out, and I did a number of different things. The first one that I did was I took all of our code from end-to-end -end with AngularJS that was in that app.js file. And if you remember the previous screencast, I was uh, having problem navigating this file. You know, I was manually grepping for uh, the authentication service, I think. And it just got really tedious because I was looking through the file to find out where the definition for that thing was. And uh, it's, it's kind of hard to figure out where it is. Oh, there it is. It's app.factory. This started to sort of highlight one of the pain points. Working in a single file, right, it doesn't scale very well. I've got all these different competing concerns and responsibilities in here. And so one of the first things I did was I took all of that code and I split it out into, into separate files. So you can see here, uh, this is my lineman directory scaffold, that app folder that I showed you. Um, here's all of the, the code that I took from end-to-end um, -end with Angular from this one file that was you know, 180 lines long, and I jammed it into here. Uh, let's just take a look at what I did. Um, and this is, there's no preset convention that Lineman imposes on you. This is just how I decided to slice things. Um, so here's my app file uh, with the top level module and that ng sanitize that we injected in security with AngularJS. And that's all that's in this file. Here's my router, which basically only has the responsibilities of configuring the route provider in Angular. I've got a, a couple of buckets for the config and run blocks that we had. So if you remember in uh, security, we dealt with the idea of protected routes, uh, very sort of trivial algorithm for that. So that's um, this run block is inside of here, protect routes, and log user out when the session expires. We had this response interceptor that we, we used. Uh, we stuck that in here. So just a really nice way to sort of stick everything into nice little buckets. So I've got my controllers all in here. Um, my directive in here. And so it was really nice to be able to um, split up that large file into small pieces, isolated units. And so now, you know, if I'm working in my app and I want to look for authentication service, there, I can, you know, I know the name of the file, I can just grab it. And then I have the context of whatever is just inside of this file. 
Uh, so how did I configure load order? Because if I'm splitting all these things up, right, yeah, it probably imposes some sort of a load order. So let's take a look at that. That's where I highlighted Lyman's config directory. So let's take a look at files. And you can see again here, the JavaScript target basically defines the files for JavaScript. Uh, and you can see that vendor is the first one and app is the second one. And my only load order dependency here is Angular needs to come first and anything else in vendor uh, needs to come after it. Uh, Angular Sanitize needs Angular to be there first. And then all my app code, and again, app is the only thing that needs to come first because I'm defining my module. And anything after that, uh, at least with respect to an Angular application, uh, is going to be injected into that um, app module. And this sort of speaks to one of the really nice design decisions in Angular, which is um, the bootstrap phase when uh, we look at our template and we add that ng app directive. Um, it's guaranteed not to occur until the DOM ready event has fired. So until all of the static assets have finished loading in the browser and the browser triggers that DOM ready event, that's when Angular will kick things off. If we go back to our end to end with Angular JS code, the next improvement uh, that I made was um, to thinking about this idea of um, promoting our rich client app, our Angular app, to a first class citizen. So what does that mean? Uh, I'll try and explain here. Basically, it means that um, as it stood in end-to-end -end with AngularJS, we were tightly coupled to Laravel as our backend. And there wasn't a ton of things that were tightly coupling us to that, um, but there were a few significant ones. The first was asset management, right? We basically had um, link elements and script elements in the head of our file that was being served up from uh, a single page view. So the load order was defined here, hard-coded, um, Angular, Sanitize, Underscore, and then everything in that app.js file. And so once we moved it to um, this directory structure where we've got things split out into separate uh, responsibilities, we're defining the load order with these very simple directives and targets in uh, our grunt config. Um, that really improved our ability to not have to worry about load order, especially in conjunction with Angular's design decision to uh, delay bootstrapping until all of the static assets have been loaded on the page. So not having to think about load order is pretty nice, at least any further than this. The other thing that, um, and so that's, you know, moving this configuration to Grunt inside of our Lineman app has uh, alleviated us from having to deal with asset management inside of our Laravel app context. And the other piece that we needed was uh, the idea of this constant, right? The CSRF token was basically the only piece of information that we needed prior uh, to our app kicking off. Um, so that any requests that we made to the back end could inject that token. And so this was tightly coupled because the page that we were rendering was a PHP page. Um, so let's take a look at what we did to extract that piece and talk about the idea of manually bootstrapping. So I added this file called bootstrap.js, and what we did um, was we added a route to Laravel. So if we take a look at Laravel app routes. These are the same routes from end to end with AngularJS. We added a route for the CSRF token. Basically, this exposes that dependency uh, so that we are not required to inject it inside of a, a page like this. We can actually query an API for it. And so um, what I'm going to show in a little bit is our Lineman app, so basically our self-contained client-side app running separately um, from our server side, uh, but being able to still operate and talk uh, to the server side because we exposed this um, CSRF token as an API endpoint. So let's just briefly take a look at how that works. Um, and this will showcase uh, how that how you can basically manually bootstrap. Uh, and when I say manually bootstrap, what I mean is, let's take a look at the homepage template. Um, you'll notice that now in my lineman context that there is no um, ng app directive. That's the directive that you use if you want uh, um, Angular to automatically bootstrap the app for you. We're not going to do that. We want to manually bootstrap because uh, before we kick off the app, we actually need to get that CSRF token um, injected as a constant, and then we can call bootstrap. So what we're doing is grabbing a handle to the document element, um, listening for that DOM ready event with Angular, grabbing a handle to our app module, going out and fetching um, that token using $.ajax, which isn't jQuery's Ajax, it's actually uh, a small tiny library called request, which is I think like 500 lines. It's just a simple Ajax transport. And the reason I did that was because 
I couldn't find a way to get a handle to HTTP uh, outside of the context of an Angular app. So I added this tiny little library called Request, um, which has a jQuery compatible API, really good browser support. And uh, I used that to fetch the token. Um, once we have that token, we can set it as a constant. Then we can actually call Bootstrap. So let's look at what this looks like. Uh, so we're going to with lineman, we'll say lineman run. Uh, you can see that similar to our vanilla grunt workflow, there's a whole bunch of tasks that were run. Uh, there's some other tasks that I'll get into specifics on what we were configuring uh, for Angular, um, but you can see that there's a whole bunch of things that just ran. Uh, and the, one of the last ones was um, we ran a server task. So Lineman includes a built-in dev server. Uh, so now if we go to localhost 8000, and you can see that it's trying to fetch that CSRF token, uh, but nothing's happening. Um, let's open up that server file. And one of the things that you can interact with, uh, and one of the things that's really useful as a front-end developer is being able to stub out API endpoints before you even have a backend. So right now I don't have my Laravel app running, which is why I'm getting that 500. It's trying to load this uh, CSRF token just from my static web server that's basically serving up uh, the files inside of this generated directory. So generated is kind of like that dev directory that we created. It's basically all of the compiled assets for dev, uh, and that's where lineman serves um, its assets out of. Let's run that again for our workflow. And uh, let's uncomment these calls. And what this does is this allows us to stub out endpoints. Uh, and this is super useful. I mentioned that uh, one of the workflow items that front-end developers often um, have on their, on their plates is they want a really easy way to stub out Ajax uh, so that they don't have to fake it. Um, and this allows us to actually use um, Express.js under the hood, which is a very lightweight uh, web server uh, and define routes in a way similar to Sinatra, if you've ever used that. And so we can stub out all of our endpoints. I'm stubbing out that CSRF token endpoint. And so now, if we uh, kick off our dev server, you can see that things are good. Um, and the token that it loaded was that one that I stubbed out. So what Lineman allows you to do is stub out these endpoints before your backend is finished. Now, obviously, we've got uh, our Laravel backend completed, but it's still pretty powerful to be able to run uh, a front-end app completely isolated from the server side uh, and still go through and actually work on these things. And you can see that there's all the other requests that it's making. So my auth request is actually making to this stub. And we can verify that just by looking at uh, the response that was returned. Flash yay for auth login. We can log out. Take a look at what was returned there. Logged out. So pretty cool, the ability uh, to stub out um, the server side so that we can sort of design our API before we even build it on the back end. Uh, but because we are extracting um, our end-to-end -end with Angular code base from Laravel, making our uh, app a basically first-class citizen uh, with all of the tooling and workflow stuff that we have, we actually want to be able to hit that Laravel app so that we can uh, test against it. So let's comment these out. Let's take a look in the config in application. And one of the other features that Lineman includes is the ability to proxy um, any API requests to a server running on a different port. And so uh, if you remember from the previous video in end to end with AngularJS, let's just go into there. Um, one of the ways that we ran that uh, server was using PHP artisan serve which started on uh, 8,000. You can actually pick which port you want to run it on uh, by doing this on 3,000. And so now if I go to localhost 3,000, there I've got my app running. And then there, this is, um, uh, you'll notice those requests are happening for the templates again. That's another thing I'm going to cover in just a second that's different when we extract it out to lineman. Um, but we don't want to do that. We want to actually be able to use uh, the stripped down version of our app that we ran 
or that we created for this. So I've pay, basically taken end to end with AngularJS. I've stripped all the client things out, stuck them into Lineman. Um, well, the server side things are still here. The only addition being uh, we've got this route for exposing the CSRF token. So let's just jump back to this API proxy. So when we run um, the workflow that I like to work with is I have my Lineman app and it's got all my client side code. I can stub out my endpoints if I want to in server. But um, the more useful thing is to be able to actually hit that API endpoint and simulate what my app is going to be like when I deploy it in production. Uh, in which case I would be basically just deploying the static HTML, uh, JS, and CSS files inside of that Laravel app or however I'd serve it. Maybe I'd serve up those static assets uh, with a, a different front end like Nginx or something like that. And as I was creating the screencast, one of the interesting pieces I ran across was um, even if I did this and ran PHP Artisan Serve, this is actually running PHP's 5.4 web, built-in web server under the hood. There's actually a bug um, in that where headers, for example, the cookie header that Laravel sets, um, if you send it a lowercase cookie header, Laravel will give you a new session on every request because the built-in PHP web server um, can't handle that. If it's an uppercase cookie header, uh, it deals with that no problem. And Lineman's API proxy is actually using an, a node module called node HTTP proxy. And it sends uh, headers in lowercase, um, which is totally valid because according to the HTTP spec, uh, you should be able to send uh, headers uh, in lowercase or uppercase, and the server shouldn't care. So this is a bug in PHP. Um, but I wasn't about to be deterred uh, from sh showing how my workflow works. And so what I did was I actually set up Nginx. Uh, you can do this with Apache as well. Um, to run my Laravel app. So now I started up Nginx, and my Nginx configuration is running on port 3000. So that's why I'm proxying here, uh, and that's running the Laravel app. So now I've got my uh, Nginx running with the Laravel app. I've got Lineman running uh, on 8000, and it's going to proxy any requests that don't match up for assets in uh, Lineman's um, static assets directory. So any of these JavaScript files, uh, CSS files, images files, template files, um, it's going to forward those onto Laravel. And so now we're on 8000, which is our Lineman app. If we reload, you can see that I got a CSRF token. It's no longer the stubbed one. This is the actual one coming from Laravel. I can verify that by actually going to 3000, grabbing it. So there's Laravel. I can reload. I'm not getting a new session set on every time. And I've effectively separated my server side into an API and my client side um, into uh, simulating what it's going to be like when I serve up uh, this HTML page and these JavaScript and CSS files from within Laravel. But I'm able to decouple them uh, and not be tied to any specific backend. And this is really cool because now I've got this target or this artifact uh, in my app um, that I can actually take and deploy on multiple different backends. Or maybe I didn't even want to have a backend. Maybe I wanted to just simulate this with HTML5 session storage. You know, I wanted to add a Rails backend and do this. As long as my Rails backend conforms to the API that I've set here in um, the routes file and implements that CSRF token uh, route and endpoint, then um, my client side assets could be deployed into any front end or any server side backend. Uh, and so when we're ready to do that, we would run line and build, which would run all of our build time dependencies. It would compile everything, concatenate everything, minify with uglify. And if we take a look at what that produces in the dist folder, you can see that we got our minified CSS file, we got our images, our minified JavaScript file, and our index.html. HTML. So the only thing we would have to do to deploy is basically copy these into Laravel's public folder or basically the, the public folder for whatever server-side framework you're using. So that would be our only deploy step. And we're working on a, a simple way to automate that um, with the idea of uh, line and deploy into, uh, and for example, Laravel. And then there would be some configuration that you would set up uh, as, a, as a grunt task. Um, so that it would know, okay, I need to run the build to generate my static assets for production, and then I need to copy all those into a specific directory. So let's go back here 
and highlight a couple other pieces uh, of the puzzle. So I talked about manually bootstrapping uh, in Bootstrap.js. You can remove the directive, the ng app directive, from your homepage. Um, you can do any kind of transport that you need to to get data from the server uh, or from your API prior to bootstrapping. Um, you know, set some values and then call angular.bootstrap. So we can do manual bootstrapping. Uh, some of the other quality of life improvements that we wanted to make uh, were we didn't want to have to um, fully qualify all of our dependencies. Uh, if you remember in the previous screencast, uh, one of the ways that you could do that is with this array of arguments. But that seems really ra rather cumbersome. Um, and yet when we go to minify, if we don't have that in here, uh, then uh, things would just break. So what we did was added uh, a couple more targets. Uh, we added grunt ng min to solve that minification. Grunt ng min, if you check it out, uh, by Bryant Ford, who actually just joined the Angular team, I believe, last week. So that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it basically allows you to uh, provide a grunt config. Let's take a look. Uh, so we want to grab any of the files that we're concatenating, uh, and we want to stick them out. So it's basically a simple input, simple output. Um, and if we take a look at those in uh, let's open up that dist directory, take a look at the minified code. And you can see that if I look for HTTP provider, here's my app module. And ngmin actually went and statically added that uh, so that I didn't have to do that in my app code. So that's very cool. Um, and that's as easy as adding uh, grunt ngmin. Let's see here. Again, I've added it to my package JSON. I've configured it in this grunt task here, loaded npm tasks. Um, this array is lineman's way of getting around having to call grunt.load npm tasks uh, every time. And we've configured it here. So whatever gets concatenated in that one bundle, I want you to output it to dest uh, with your static analysis. So that happens once. Similarly, um, if you noticed, uh, there's no requests for templates because all of the templates are basically pre-compiled. Let's take a look at what that looks like. That's set up using Grunt Angular templates. So again, we've automated uh, pre-compiling our templates so that we don't have to load them over XHR. So I've added the task, it's a, an NPM task, and then I've configured it with this configuration target. Uh, we want to grab templates from um, here, app templates, and they want to go into uh, generated Angular and the template cache, um, at least for uh, development mode. And we want to grab any of the templates here. So you can see that inside of this templates directory, I've got my home page. And then I've got all of those uh, templates that we had from the previous app. So that's pretty much all you need to do. You need to add ng templates and ng min. Uh, and those quality of life um, tasks automate a lot of really nice things for us. Let's open up the template cache and just take a look at what that looks like. So here's generated. Let's see, Angular. There's my template cache. So again, it knows about the context of our app module. Uh, it's injecting the template cache, uh, and it's just going to put um, values for a particular key, so angular slash books, angular slash home, uh, which map to those um, right there, angular slash books, angular slash home, and it's just pre-compiled the templates and stuck them into the JavaScript so that we don't have to have those XHRs. So that's my workflow with Lineman. Uh, it allows me to really easily decouple my front end code um, so that I can work on things separately from the server. Uh, when I'm ready to, I can hook up this API proxy so that I can actually run my server side and my client side and, and sort of see how they connect it together. Uh, and it just gives me the power to treat my front end development as a first class citizen. Uh, if you're interested in uh, Lineman, you can check out linemanjs.com. If you've heard of uh, another popular tool like in this similar vein, uh, Yeoman, Lineman's kind of like Yeoman's little brother. It doesn't do as much as Yeoman, uh, and it definitely doesn't have as many generators. It's been kind of handcrafted for our workflow, uh, but we've had 
pretty good feedback from people that have been using it uh, to build um, client-side heavy applications. We've also got a bunch of templates. We've got one for Backbone, Angular, and Ember. So if you check out, uh, I on my GitHub repo, I have one called Lineman Angular Template that basically gives you uh, what I just showed you, the pre-configured template pre-compilation, ng-min, um, and a lot of the stuff that we built in this app uh, sort of as a starting point so that you can use to uh, continue to build against. And it's got support for that uh, API server built in and all those kinds of things. So let's just talk a little bit about why it's important to have this kind of a separation. Um, we looked at building things with Vanilla Grunt, showed you how you could craft a workflow, how to configure tasks, install NPM tasks, how to make custom tasks, uh, and why it's important to be able to make your own workflow to re relieve the cognitive load that we often have as developers working on these mundane tasks. Um, so that's in the with Grunt folder that you can check out on GitHub. Then I showed sort of what was necessary to extract um, our tightly coupled end-to-end -end with AngularJS app from within Laravel and pull all of those static assets out and use something like Lineman um, to be able to, you know, not have everything in one big file, um, control load order, have some really nice quality of life improvements like the ability to pre-compile -comp pre templates using Grunt Angular templates, um, using ng-min so that I don't have to fully qualify dependencies uh, in my Angular code. Um, and just the idea of treating this app as a first-class citizen, decoupled from that server-side framework so that I have the flexibility to take this app and plug it into Rails or plug it into Python Django or maybe not even use a backend at all. I've just got this nice little self-contained artifact that can be in a separate code base. And so that's in the with lineman folder. And then the modifications that I actually made to Laravel uh, weren't that many. You know, again, just added this uh, CSRF token route to expose that. Um, I showed you how we can bootstrap manually. And uh, that's basically what I wanted to show. This, um, this isn't exhaustive. There's probably other things that you're going to want to add uh, to customize your workflow. But I think it's important to understand the fundamentals, to understand Grunt at a lower level, to take a look at abstraction, and to just take a look at an example of how somebody else uh, works with um, their front-end code and, and a workflow that works for them. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to hit me up on Twitter or um, contact me on GitHub. Uh, you can file an issue against Lineman. Uh, it's in the testable organization. I'm going to include links to all this stuff in the video description. Please check it out. And I hope that uh, at a minimum this has given you an idea of what it takes to be able to build a workflow for yourself uh, and enough interest that you would be able to use something just like even if you just use Vanilla Grunt to craft yourself a workflow. That's a net win in my opinion because I think more developers need to figure out how um, to be able to have the power to craft their own workflows. Thanks for watching, and again, please hit me up on Twitter with any questions. Bye.